As the Great War rages in Belgium and France, a young field nurse searches for her missing brother and a mysterious figure with a violin who appears to the soldiers. In the Warm Hands of Ghosts, that's the book I'm reviewing on this episode of SFF 180, along with a little bonus at the end, so stick around. Hello again, everyone. Thomas here, your host, as always. Thanks so much for joining me. The Great War, which is what everyone called World War I before they knew there'd be another one, was an event so horrific that it was absolutely unprecedented, not only in warfare, but in human experience. The machinery of the industrial world was put to the task of mass slaughter, and the experience tore apart not only the bodies of those killed, but the minds of many who survived. Culturally, it caused shockwaves as well, as Catherine Arden points out, forcing people from one era, the late Victorians and early Edwardians, into a new one with very little time to adjust. Catherine Arden is not a writer interested in repeating herself to her infinite credit. She followed her popular folk fantasy Winter Night trilogy with her middle grade spook show Small Spaces and has now delivered The Warm Hands of Ghosts, a bleak, often gut wrenching, but deeply felt standalone tale set in the ravaged landscape of the Belgian countryside during the latter days of the war. It is without question her best and most mature work yet. It's a story about maintaining connection, not just with our loved ones, but with our own sense of self, when the world has gone mad and everything around us is aligned towards our destruction. It's 1918, and Laura Ivan, a field nurse who has been sent back from the front to her home in Nova Scotia after sustaining injuries of her own, is a woman who has lost everything. Her younger brother, Freddy, has gone missing and is naturally presumed dead after the Battle of Passchendaele, while back home, the freak explosion of a supply ship in the Halifax Harbor has killed both her parents. Now she rooms in the stately home of a trio of wealthy sisters, elderly spinsters with a fondness for seances. One day, Laura receives an unexpected package, but not from the Red Cross. It contains her brother's tattered uniform and some personal effects, and also his complete set of dog tags. Now, this is strange, because if a soldier is killed in action, one tag is returned to his family while the other is left with his body. There is no official telegram confirming Freddy's death, but there is a cryptic unsigned postcard indicating Freddy may very well be alive somewhere. And this is all it takes to convince Laura to go back to the worst place in the world. Now, we know that Freddy is alive. The story alternates between Laura's search for Freddy and his own survival ordeal several months prior, towards the end of 1917. Trapped beneath a demolished pillbox with a German soldier, Hans Winter, with whom he quickly bonds, the two men eventually dig their way out, where they soon encounter an enigmatic figure calling himself Faland. Is he the devil? or some kind of trickster god. Faland is a French name derived from a Latin root word meaning false. But what Faland promises the lost soldiers of the Western Front feels all too real and desirable, peace and safety, in exchange for their memories, which Faland uses to power his music. Winter manages to resist these charms, but Freddy proves all too susceptible. And speaking of Faland, Arden is able to make her fantasy elements feel completely organic because her chosen historical setting is already one in which a great many people felt as if the veil between life and death was very thin. Spiritualism had been popular for decades. Victorians widely believed they could speak to their dead loved ones, and World War I soldiers commonly shared stories about the ghosts and wild men of no man's land, deserters who had gone insane and apparently feral. Now, into this environment, Arden introduces Faland and his hotel, which seems to obey no physical laws and whose endless doors open into past and future. Arden's writing is sublime. She conveys the apocalyptic horror of the Great War without flinching, she gives all of her characters such grounded humanity that, however deep their own personal tragedies may be, the emotions are never cloying or contrived. At no time does Laura and Freddy's search for each other ever collapse into pathos. Even Philand can't be interpreted in simplistic good or evil terms. I mean, who could blame anyone, especially on the Western Front, for embracing his offer? 
One thing Moore teaches us today, and that Arden conveys so eloquently, is that not everyone who lives through it is necessarily a survivor. To survive at all, we have to draw strength from each other and do it together. Now, it's always nice when I have a chance to do one of these, and I hope to have more soon, but if the Warm Hands of Ghosts captures you, it would be worthwhile to track down a copy of Patricia Anthony's 1998 novel, Flanders, also set during the Great War and featuring a young American soldier coming of age in a haunted battlefield and awakening to the cruelties of the wider world. Patricia Anthony had a brief but notable SFF career in the 90s, releasing a number of critically acclaimed titles through Ace Books. Her biggest success, Brother Termite, in 1993, was optioned by James Cameron, and a screenplay was even written by none other than John Sayles, who added a scene that Patricia admired enough to say she wished she'd thought of it for the book. But the movie never went into production, although if you have the Blu-ray of Avatar... Apparently, the bonus material includes some Brother Termite test footage, showing off early experiments with motion capture. Anthony's SF novels took a critical look at human society through the plot device of alien encounters. But late in the 90s, she was growing tired of that and tried her hand at a kind of slipstream speculative lit fic, much to Ace's displeasure. They barely promoted Flanders, and it bombed, releasing Anthony from her contract. And after she stopped writing novels, she tried her hand unsuccessfully at screenwriting, but sadly died in 2013 at the age of 66, before having a chance to mount a real comeback. The commercial failure of Flanders really sucks, because I gave the book five stars back in the day and still consider it a dead-ass masterpiece. The book is very reminiscent of All Quiet on the Western Front, but perhaps with a more accessible sensibility for modern readers. Our hero is Travis Lee Stanhope, a young Texan who joins a British regiment at the Western Front before America's formal entry into the war, basically because he's fleeing an awful home life and an alcoholic father. As all young men do in stories like these, Travis quickly learns that war isn't as heroic and romantic as the recruiting posters tell you. Travis's dreams are filled with visions of a peaceful cemetery where his fallen fellow soldiers lie beneath glass, watched over by a girl in a calico dress. He also sees ghosts in the trenches during his waking hours, and in addition to the horrors of combat, Travis discovers injustices right at home. One of his fellow soldiers turns out to be some monstrous sex criminal, but because he's so highly decorated, he'll never face punishment. And his captain, Miller, is both Jewish and secretly gay, thus facing bigotry on two counts. The most sobering moment in the story is when Travis realizes Miller's own superiors are setting him up to fail, simply because they don't want to see his type more successful in battle than they've been. Flanders is brilliant because it's unsentimental and unpretentious. Now, I read it when I was a bit younger. I mean, I wasn't a kid, but still at an age when I really thought deeply about how lucky I am to have been born in my generation, and not 20 or 30 years earlier, where I might have been shipped off to be blown in half on another country's soil before I reached 20. I'm fortunate to have avoided horrors that so many young men had to endure through no desire of my own, and which so many innocent people are enduring right this minute. And it makes me feel an even greater affinity for them. Anyway, you can check out my full-length review of Flanders at sff180.com, which I will link down below. And there you have it. That's all I've got time for this episode of SFF 180. Remember, the most important thing, these are reviews. You will not always agree with me, but if you enjoyed watching, slam that like button, share the video far and wide with all of your SFF reading friends, and above all, please subscribe if you have not done so. That is how the channel grows. You can also support the channel at my Tee Public store and at my Patreon, where recruits into Wix Army occasionally get little perks like early access to some of my videos, but mostly what I use the Patreon money for is to help pay Matt Olson, my brilliant, gifted, talented channel artist who does all of my wonderful and amazing thumbnails and channel art for me. So the additional help is greatly appreciated. Thank you so much. And I want to thank all the rest of you for being the very best viewers in all of BookTube. And until I see all of you next time, Please stay safe and healthy and happy reading.